the head of Goldman Sachs at the very top of the financial pyramid worldwide. Back in the early 2000s, she basically discovered uh, what the larger plan was and quit her very successful, lucrative job where she was uh, rising quickly through the ranks and wrote books exposing it. And she is going to be with us for the next 52 minutes at nomiprins.com. And it ties into these articles. Hillary Clinton, Jeb Bush, and the big banks. Four factors behind rising volatility and how to deal with them. Nomiprins.com. Jeb all in. The Bush dynasty and the banker friends. Go for round three. Again, she wrote the article. They got picked up by papers all over the world. Nomi Prince, Hillary, Bill, and the big six banks. They're all in the same crew. It's totally staged. We talk about Hillary and Jeb Bush. The only question is, which one is the ringer? Her new book, All the Presidents, The Hidden Alliances That Drive American Power, is already a bestseller. And she joins us. Uh, I'm going to intersperse because I meant to get to it last hour. I haven't yet. Former CIA head said he wouldn't be surprised if terrorists didn't hit this July 4th, saying ISIS is in the country and, quote, in our basements. Well, yeah, because you let them in because you funded them. That was on CBS Nightly News. They create the crisis. They allow the terrorists to attack. Then they offer the solution. And then we're going to get into Obama has issued 19 classified directives. So now they're not just directives that bypass Congress. They're classified. And that dovetails with Obama, signs Bill giving himself fast-track powers for trade deals. We'll get Nomi's take on that. U.S. justices turn down states over voter registration restrictions right as they ship in record numbers of illegals. So the plan is pretty clear. It's all coming up in this hour. In the third hour, I'm going to get to a bunch of special reports dealing with the attack on the human brain. Believe me, those articles are legion, and we'll have some calls then uh, as well. I'm not going to go over her whole bio because it's lengthy, but she received her BS degree from uh, mathematics from uh, SUNY, purchased an MS degree in statistics from New York University. Before becoming a journalist, Nomi worked on Wall Street as a managing director at Goldman Sachs and ran the International Analytics Group, see that's why it's key, at Bear Stearns in London. She's a member of the... Uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, uh, Federal Reserve Reform Advisory Council, enlisted as one of America's top wonks on the Federal Reserve. She's a senior fellow at the nonpartisan public policy think tank, Deimos. And her latest book is All the President's Bankers. With uh, Jim Rogers and others saying that Greece is collapsing this week, I want to play that clip. And with CNBC admitting we're all slaves to international banks, central banks, this is a designed program where they build it too big to fail, set up the system, and have a cascade of collapses that consolidate world power until they appoint the leaders of Greece, they appoint the leaders of Italy, they appoint the leaders in Latin American countries, and they basically select the leaders here. That's all coming up, but first, here's Jim Rogers. How is that going to affect the economy there? Well, of course, it's going to affect it badly. If you cannot get any money, you cannot spend it, and we are not reverting to a barter economy yet anyway. But no, of course, the, the Greece, Greek economy is going to collapse this week and probably for a while. People are terrified, and you would be too. So would I. No, I mean, what about the overall picture here? Greece. We see the very same preparations they made in Greece before the bank holiday, the not letting folks get their money out or 66 euros uh, a day being set up all over the Western world. We see elites ringing the alarm bell so they can act like they warned us, but you warned us. Uh, I guess 14 years ago, um, I want to give you the floor for the eight minutes before break or I'll interrupt the whole time. I want you to really give us the state of the world. You've predicted this all very accurately in your books, in your articles. I want to talk about where we are right now financially. Then I want to look at your expert breakdown of the Clintons and the Bushes and the elections coming up here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for, for having me on, Alex. Um, I, I'm going to start then with... Um, 
how our current big banking system culminated in the last, well, basically uh, since the repeal of Glass-Steagall Act in 1999. But, but really, uh, in, in the last 14 years, there has been immense consolidation at the hands, particularly of the big six banks in the United States. That's Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, uh, Bank of America, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Wells Fargo in two different stages. The first stage um, really relates to a little bit of what you were talking about before in terms of international security and those kinds of issues that you discussed, which was in the 2001-2002 period when the Enron scandal was breaking, when the WorldCom scandal was breaking, after banks had consolidated their first element of power in the wake of the Glass-Steagall Act being repealed under the Clinton administration in 1999 and enabling them, therefore, to become bigger and more concentrated and more in control of our capital worldwide, um, those scandals were masked by ultimately 9-11 um, and what happened in Iraq. While that was going on, while attention was focused there, something else happened in the United States, which is that rates were cut um, banks started to accumulate more leverage, trade more riskily, and so forth in bigger fashion, enabled by government policy, enabled by the Federal Reserve policy. This went on until we saw the break in 2007, 2008 with the global financial crisis in which we are still consumed. As a result of that phase, right, the global financial crisis beginning on the back of these banks, concentrating their capital at the hands of government and Federal Reserve policy, as well as global associated policy, um, we had this financial catastrophe. Since then, and this is important because it sets us up to what's happening in Greece and what's going on in Europe and globally, since then, our big six banks, the ones that were at the pinnacle, at the crux, at the, at the creation of the financial crisis, have grown, just the U.S. six banks, have grown in assets by 42%. They have grown in deposits, our deposits, by 86%. And their cash reserves, because of Federal Reserve and other zero interest rate and quantitative easing policy, are 400% larger. So they are in, despite that, a tremendously precarious position and want more. Because they have wanted more, and it's not just the big six banks in the United States, but they have really benefited the most from what's happened since the financial crisis globally in terms of their own concentration and power, and, and as I just mentioned, the assets, the deposits, and the cash that they have, um, it's also a global phenomenon, of course, with the ECB and so forth. So what has been seven years of enabling them to have zero interest rate cash, to accumulate their own reserves, to pretend that they are solvent, because that was supposedly why the Federal Reserve stepped in to give them this gift of liquidity and cheap money, which has really hurt everybody else. We get nothing on our savings accounts. We pay banks to hold our money. And now they're talking about ways to bail in or continue to hold our money if there is another phase of this crisis, which there will be. Now we turn over to what's happened since this accumulation has gone on in this phase to what's going on in Greece today. In 2008, Greece actually had the same debt to GDP ratio, which was around 100%, not great, but the same as what France has today. As what France, the, the sort of epicenter of core European power with Germany has today. They had lower unemployment, they could manage their funds, they were actually okay. But in the wake of the 2008 crisis, when all banks around the world were looking to batten down the hatches and control capital and receive these benefits, of low interest rate and, and buying of their bonds and creation of more debt uh, to go through the banks to then be repurchased by the Fed in quantit NACB and quantitative easing programs, places like Greece, which is the, the epicenter of obviously tragedy today, have had to deal with the fallout. So whereas today the blame, the sort of perception is that, that Greece couldn't manage its finances, that its pensioners are lazy, that its workers don't do anything. The reality is in 2008, Greece was fine. And as part of the global financial crisis, the consolidation of control and capital and policies away from places like Greece, it bore the brunt of downgrades, of austerity programs, of the acquisition in return for bailout funds of their country. And as a result, their country weakened. Any country would. They were downgraded six times between 2011, 2010 and 2011 during this part of this crisis while they were given bailout money, while the terms of that bailout money from the Troika, from the ECB and IMF and so forth, were so heinous that all they did 
And I, I looked at my website, actually. I, I wrote a piece on this to break in 2012. February 2012 said the Greek tragedy is just beginning. Um, and it's on my thoughts page somewhere on my website. But, but the reality is it was beginning because it was the epicenter of this process of controlling a country's capital by forcing that country into not just austerity, but into depression. Now, there's lessons from the depression, Alex. This, this, Alex, this is really cool that you mentioned this in the beginning of, of, of your intro to me. I appreciate it. In the Great Depression, the first one in the 30s that was catalyzed by the big six banks in the United States in the 1929 crash, and, and people were trying to get their money out of banks because at the time there was no deposit insurance. And though banks were big and powerful and their leaders were associated with Washington and governments throughout the world, they didn't have anywhere near as much power as they have today because at that point, the Federal Reserve was still in its infancy and it didn't stick along with the ECB, which didn't exist then. Seven trillion dollars worth. No, I mean, we've got to go to break. Come back with this key point after we return. But I just want to point out, that's why we had you on. I remember having you on when you wrote that article three years ago. But even before that, predicting all of this. But here's the key. You just calmly drop that bombshell which is public information but nobody's talking about it they've now had banker bailouts worldwide with our tax money the new model that's not enough they want to keep our money in the account and do a bail-in like cyprus and steal our money publicly doing what john corzine only tried to do a few years ago at mf global i mean this is unprecedented and they're getting ready to do it here you know, I actually had Nomi Prince come to Austin, Texas. And we've released some of the interview for the Obama Deception 2 that I got so busy I never completed. We are working on just releasing it to the public because it needs to be seen. And in those videos, I it just clicked and I just remembered. She laid out everything and predicted what would happen in Greece is now happening and talked about how it's premeditated. And again, she worked at the highest levels inside these organizations. But regardless of whether it's premeditated or not, we know it is, the same effect. They're too big to fail. They create the derivatives. We bail out the banks. Then our nation states go into default because we bailed them out. That's the biggest part of it. And we're being maneuvered towards a global collapse, which will give them even more power. 2008 was just the global positioning for this. And now the installation of world leaders under banker technocratic control, their words, not mine. And the arrogance of the EU, same as the American Union or TPP, same people, threatening Greece, you, you better not have a referendum. Nomi Prenz joins us, was managing director at Goldman Sachs, new book, All the President's Bankers. This is a short segment, long segment coming up, but you, you got cut off going through a parallel of the same big five, six mega banks in the Depression who head up the private Federal Reserve, that's their government, quasi-government consortium, for those that don't know, running the same playbook now, but on a global scale. But back then, the U.S. wasn't tied under an international bank of settlements. So I love watching international bank of settlements a few days ago. Go, oh, a global meltdown's coming. It's terrible. The Federal Reserve and other central banks did a bad job when they represent these people. I mean, I love watching them tattle on themselves, playing on the public's financial illiteracy. Yeah, no, that, that, that's, that's an amazing, their, their 85th annual report, the Bank of International Settlements, which ties into that depression period. So again, those big six banks, the Federal Reserve in its infancy, our government at the time, crash in 1929 happens, people can't get their money. Uh, so basically, at the end of that, people try to get their money, we get deposit insurance, we get a Glass-Steagall Act passed, we, we have some control over the division of our deposits, our money, um, from the risky transactions and consolidation of the bigger banks. And it, and it worked for a number of decades. But that started to dis dissipate in the 70s, 80s, and so forth. That's when bail-in economics started. And what bail-in economics, which is a, a, a combination of the private banks and, and leading these institutions, as you mentioned, um, as well as the governments, as well as these, these central bank institutions and the BIS and the IMF and so forth. They, they now all use the bailout as a way to put themselves <laughs> into it, hold us hostage to them through the FDIC and similar systems. Well, exactly. And actually, that was one of FDR's main concerns at the time. Put in the FDIC because people were scared. He wanted banks to be able to, to, sit, you know, to have people's money protected. Otherwise, they wouldn't put money in the bank. So in a way, it was helping the banks. On the other hand, he was concerned that this could happen because now our money 
is kind of hostage, well, it is actually hostage uh, to this greater leverage and these greater plans, and it has become that. So when you see now what's going on in Greece where they had to, they had no choice but to install capital controls. That is reminiscent of the pre-Great Depression Glass-Steagall days when people were trying to get money out of banks and they had no recourse at the time, and when banks went under, their money was just simply gone. And now we see that happening in Greece. Clearly, we see the preparations being made for this all over the West. Can you speak to that and what you think that signifies? Well, what it signifies, Greece is in this position where it's defending itself against these, these egregious bailout terms that were put upon it to begin with as a result of capital you know, killing them and then coming out in the 2008 period in the financial crisis. So, you know, the big banks, these institutions, they want they wanted money from Greece. They wanted Greece. And now they have Greece in a chokehold. And Greece is trying to do anything it can to protect itself. In the Great Depression, what Greece did was it left it's tied to the British pound when the British pound devalued. It, it, it floated the drachma. It sorted out its own economics, and it actually flourished relative to the rest of Europe before a lot of the Great Depression was over relative to other countries. So, I mean, it had the mechanism before. But the point of the balance, the point of going after cash is, is, is bigger because what can now happen is large banks, Forget the small ones in, in, in Greece, but large banks like Citigroup can go to, well, they, they, they are part of, go to the Federal Reserve, talk to the government, say, you know what, we need to have mechanisms to control cash right now in case something like this. Oh, they're, as you know, I covered it two weeks ago. They're now, speaking of Citi, we can show that headline, saying we need to control the cash to decide where it's spent and when. Just bizarre totalitarian statements nakedly in the opening showing their trial ballooning. Right. And rather than, you know, looking at Greece as something that requires leadership and fixing and, 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 and you know, the fact that these these bailout terms were, were egregious and austerity was to begin with, they're using it and they will use it. They will use it as an example of why these cash control mechanisms should be infused, because the reality is they are not solvent after seven years of zero interest rate policy, liquidity infusions from the central banks, a $7 trillion book between the ECB and the Federal Reserve supporting the private banking system and these big banks. Even with that, even with 400% more cash sure. than they had before, even with less loans to people. No, I mean, stay there. I'm going to give you the floor when we come back to roll with this. I don't want to get into politics uh, and how they're maneuvering their people in like a Don King boxing match where they win either way. Stay with us. I'm Alex Jones, Infowars.com. They want you to be scared of things that really are non-existent out there, boogeymen. But don't be scared of the globalists taking your country over. I want Nomi Prince to finish up a point that got cut off by the break. Talk about where all this is going and talk about the mindset of these people. Because we had Joseph Sticklitz on 2002, 2006. We've had him on five, six times. Two-time Nobel Prize winner, former head of economics, of, of, of economics, head economist at the World Bank. And he basically admitted here, this is a planned takeover. And that it's very immoral. He didn't want to be part of it. He left in 2002. Nomi left Goldman Sachs around the same time. So there was already corruption and problems and greed in global banking. But it got really draconian around 2002, according to Greg Pallas and other investigative journalists. It really started getting bad. And it's bipartisan across the world or tripartisan or quadpartisan in like Germany, where there are four major parties, three major parties in England, two here. And they just buy you off. We've had hundreds of senior bankers killed, Arkansas. And, and all of this is building towards a head. We're going to go back to our guest here in a moment, her new book, All the President's Bankers, The Hidden Alliances That Drive American Power. I remember mainline Republican Oid talk show host 15 years ago saying I was a kook and a liar and that there didn't even exist a council on foreign relations and that there were no global banks and global government. Now it's all pretty much out in the open. But they first created a politically correct stigma towards criticizing it. That stigma's kind of over. In fact, you guys have the famous, there's a bunch of these clips, but the MSNBC where it's like five minutes long and all five of the pundits and the guest a host all agree that aren't we just slaves to central bankers? And then they admit it. We'll cue that up. So, so this is the big enchilada. And they don't want to fix things because every crisis that comes, they get more power. We're going to go back to Nomi in a moment, but get her book, read it, give it to friends and family. Pretty soon it'll be a conspiracy theory that people ever even read or that women gave birth vaginally or breastfed. I mean, or, or that seeds weren't GMO. I mean, I'm not joking. This is a hardcore 
scientific takeover. But before we go any further, in the entire month of July, and I've decided to launch it a day early, we've never done this for a whole month, free shipping on everything that we ship. That's 90 plus percent of the products. A few of the products are drop shipped, like shortwave radios and some of the water filters, uh, but everything else is absolutely in-house. The high quality non-GMO seeds, the lowest prices, uh, the great nutraceuticals like X2, even though that's selling out, uh, the the colloidal silver, the super male, super female vitality, the lung cleanse, uh, all of it is available with free shipping. And a lot of these products, like the Made in America apparel, uh, there's a bunch of t-shirt specials, a bunch of Molon Labe belt buckle specials, 25% off on top of free shipping. So that applies on top of all the other specials. I just keep doubling down on the free market activities, and it's been successful. Uh, less profit per capita item, very competitive, uh, plus you're supporting hardcore liberty and the truth. It's a win-win buying war bonds and the info war. They've still got 20% off going on the water filters. They've still got 25% off going on the on the Molon Labe, uh, Made in America products. I mean, it's all there, InfoWarsLife.com, InfoWarsStore.com, or 888-888. Two five three three one three nine, and, and I guess I was wrong. I, I've been I've been told there there is free shipping on the water filters as well. I was I thought it wasn't being extended to stuff that's drop ship, but but it is. So infowarstore.com or eight 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 two five three three one three nine. There are so many specials on the site right now, and your purchase makes the TV show, the radio shows, the the uh, nightly news, the films, the books, the special reports. Everything we do that, that is hitting political pay dirt, unifying the left and right, transcending the diversions, the balkanization, exposing the globalists, exposing their paradigm. This is huge. Getting people outside the matrix. We're building towards that V for Vendetta moment, but not an explosive, violent moment, but a revelation. I was thinking about, then we'll go into our guest doing a piece like how ranch dressing could save the world. And that's the kind of thing that will wake up the sheeple. They'll see a headline like that. I'm sure somebody else will do this now. That's fine. And then the sheeple will click on that, and I'll say, that's right. No one knows when people in the 80s started putting ranch dressing on pepperoni pizza mainly. But now uh, most major chains and most restaurants offer it because it's popular. No one knows who started it, but it started with one person. And now it's ubiquitous all over the world, not just here. You know, why does that matter? It doesn't. But I've talked to top NSA insiders on air and off air. We've had William Benny, the former technical director, right here of two feet from me sitting here. I've, I had James Bamford on. I had just countless whistleblowers on 20 years ago. I did not engage in espionage against the criminal globalists. I was approached at movie theaters where I did showings a few times and at the rodeo by people claiming they had worked with the NSA. And they would explain to me, just like in a V for Vendetta moment where the cops being talked to by V at the park. And they told me it's about stealing other countries' data and giving it to the globalists to build in China. It's about destroying the free market. It's about if strawberries are trending. This was I was actually told this as an example, getting ahead of the trend and being able to dominate it. It's about shutting down trends that threaten the globalist or disruptive technology to their takeover. And I kind of knew that, but here they were telling me. And, and your scientific Atlantic cable boxes are listening to you. Break one open on air, and I did, and it was there. And, and just on and on and on. The TVs uh, already have microphones in them. Boom, they were. Now it's all admitted. And I'm talking about in the parking lot, three-minute conversations twice. And like, here's the technicals of the Time Warner system wired into the NSA. And I called my dad, and he goes, throw it away. Throw it in a trash can. Don't even look at it, because it was true. I mean, they arrest you for that, folks. I don't even know if it was a setup. But the point is that that's the world where I live, okay? And now it's all come out. And, and, and this is a total takeover. And a lot of people have gone through hell to bring you this information. And now it's all coming out in the open because they're going to launch their final phases of the takeover. Now I've been ranting. You got the floor for the uh, 10 minutes left in this segment and the six minutes of the next. Nomi Prins, all the president's bankers, nomiprins.com. We should republish in InfoWars your article from three years ago predicting the whole Greece situation. In fact, I'm going to do that now uh, and put a link to your site at the bottom of it. Um, but we've got interviews with you, not just on radio, but here in studio. 
uh, talking about. I'm going to put that out in the next few days. It just reminded me. But Nomi, you've heard my rant here about where we stand. Do you think I'm wrong that they're lined up for their next big takeover, their next big phase? They're, they have the Pope calling for global government. I mean, it's getting really obvious now. Private central banks are going to implode the world economy and offer a new global SDR, digital currency, uh, that pegs all the other currencies. And they're getting ready for the final crisis to bring in their total takeover. Or is there another crisis after that? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just listening to you, Alex, and that when you said final crisis, I'm not quite sure if there is a final one. I, I, I think, you know, as you, as, you, as you capped off there, 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 there could be a series of crises. But, but, but yes, what has happened, um, and this has been decades in the building, but more accelerated uh, since the financial crisis 2008, because that was just the most recent inflection point of the most epic and unprecedented, even with the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements, the central bank of the central bank saying so at this point, of, of subsidization, because that's the first step in control. It's always the first step in control financially um, of the, the private banking slash central banking system. They got to get us on the hook for their crimes. Well, well exactly. And, and, and this is what's been happening. So, you know, I'll tell you, it, it goes back to, uh, well, it goes back a lot of ways, but 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 in the 80s, you know, we talk about uh, you know, Reagan's Treasury Secretary was the CEO of Merrill Lynch back then, the first CEO from a major uh, U.S. bank that was in that position. Uh, he was friends with uh, George H.W. Bush. They got together, deregulated part of the industry to allow it to consolidate its power and its capital as a byproduct of that. This was around the time of the Latin American debt crisis. That was kind of like the current Greece and European and global crisis that we're having today, which is that the private banks did a lot of tricky dealings, lavished a lot of debt, which was sort of cover for all sorts of other extractions of, of private assets and other ways of sort of transporting what was in some of these countries into, um, into their context, into their asset base. And when that failed, when it went belly up, when those countries couldn't sustain the bad terms of the debt that they had, these countries came, these banks, I'm sorry, they're countries, they are countries, they're larger than countries. These banks came to uh, the United States government and said, we need a bailout. And under, under, Reagan, under Reagan, under Bush, under Brady, under all these people starting in the, in the 80s and then working in through the Clinton administration, the 90s, the Bush and Obama administrations more recently, um, they continued to receive banking subsidies liquidity subsidies, capital, the purchasing of their crappy toxic assets, the ongoing um, aid, the ongoing aid to them for the risk they took with our money in greater and greater ways. So the 2008 component of this particular phase of financial crisis and consolidation of control and capital, because it is about power and money together, those two things are not distinct, um, is setting us up for the next phase. And as I started to say before, and we talked about it a little bit, is, is the money aspect um, is the only thing that hasn't really been touched in this particular phase. Banks have had subsidies. They've had liquidity injections. The central banks for a minute said, this is great. Look, they're so well capitalized. We put in all these new rules. The next time there's a crisis, they're going to be fine. But everyone knows at that level, those elite levels, they are not fine. And one of the ways we know, we know publicly on our side of the equation that they are not fine is because they also want cash. Um, and as I started to say before, the, the Greek situation now putting in capital controls to defend itself from the extraction, from these policies of taking smaller countries' assets, um, diluting them and accumulating them outside into the larger, more elite countries and governments and, and powerful banks um, is something that's going to continue. Um, and so it's a political aspect, it is a power aspect, it's a private banking aspect, and it is a central banking aspect altogether. And it's happening now in an unprecedented way. Because instead of after the 2008 crisis of defusing this power, all of these bodies came together to basically concentrate that power. And that's why in particular the United States, and this is really important, in particular the United States banks have concentrated more of their power, both politically as well as from a concentration of capital standpoint relative to Europe. So whereas before the 2008 crisis, there was a sort of mix between the European banks going nuts with the bets that they were taking and the leverage they were taking and the problems that they were incurring on the local economies with not lending to them, but instead saving the capital they were getting from their central bank, from the ECB to, to solidify themselves and make all of those rulers feel happy and content because it was free money to them. 
The United States banking system has been the biggest recipient of this global policy to date. So whereas initially, going back a couple of wars, the end of World War I, the end of World War II, the United States always became a greater superpower because of its control over bank capital, because of the policies that different entities could aggregate together and ensue upon the general financial system. After World War II, of course, we got the IMF, we got the World Bank. Those were, those were mechanisms of deciding which countries would receive aid and which countries would receive real aid. And real aid was cheap money. Real the beginning aid. of a banking-based global government. Uh, and now, what do you see this new consolidation doing? Because it, it looks like this, this, this big next epic phase, not the final phase, but for all intents and purposes, the launch of global corporate government openly let me ask you this question. What does it do to America and Europe? Because it appears in the past they ate Latin America, Africa, areas of Asia, and, and the third world and old world. Now, as the World Bank document showed in 2002, they want to fully consolidate power here uh, and have us bail them out yet again, then making us their slaves in the process. True alchemy. Uh, I mean, it. my point is a lot of people think, America being behind the global empire is good, but doesn't the average person just fit the bill? Well, we as, as, as Americans, by being at the bottom of that equation, you know, so when the U.S. banking system, the political system, the Federal Reserve and, and, and still these policies across the world and sort of control it. I mean, it was our Treasury Department, United States Treasury Department, United States Federal Reserve that incurred these policies throughout the world. It was Tim Geithner and you know, who went over to Europe and said and, and Jack Lew afterwards, just, you know, you guys have to do these same policies. You have to continue them. We need zero interest rate. We need you to buy bonds. We need you to infiltrate. Um, your policies, which are our policies on a global basis, that is control. I mean, that, that is the United States controlling the equation. And in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008, we have become more in control over most of uh, the global financial alchemy, as you mentioned it. Where we don't have the same control is over sort of the Russian and China, the aspects that are trying to independently create their own uh, trading systems, their own currency, their own development banks. But those are still small. They're still small relative to what's happening on the U.S. European basis where the U.S. Um, is really controlling the shots because we had the first subsidy program for our private banks. Our banks became bigger relative to European banks after the financial crisis. Our Fed has four and a half trillion dollars of assets on its balance sheet, among all sorts of other plays to, to, to prop up this, this global financial system as per coming from the United States elements um, versus a two and a half trillion that's being accumulated at the ECB. It will probably grow to three trillion. So what's happening is all of these subsidies are continuing to grow. All of the central banks led by uh, the United States are continuing to take signals from the United States and the U.S. government. And whether it is an Obama administration, whether it is a Hillary Clinton administration, whether it is a Jeb Bush administration, will continue on this play. And this play will continue to consolidate capital and power at the hands of these individuals who are the most legacy connections, historical relationships, and, and, and similar ideologies from a globalist perspective um, as the U.S. banks have. All right, stay there. I want to come back and get into your article that was in New York Daily News. Hillary Clinton, Jeb Bush, and the big banks. It's also at nomiprins.com. And look at how these two horses, or these two fighters, might as well be in a rigged Don King boxing match. And who do you think the anointed one will be? Or will they let us choose from two of their minions who will follow orders. Nomi Prince, former managing director Goldman Sachs, is our guest. In the third hour, we're going to cover the waterfront. Stay with us. Well, a civil rights icon, and we'll cover this in the next hour, has come out and said the problem is blacks killing other blacks, not the Confederate flag. New knockout game, nearly 50 black teens raid Walmart, attack shop or destroy merchandise. ISIS burns CIA opium fields in Afghanistan. They're going to get in trouble for that. They're now in Afghanistan. Social justice Twitters referred to periods as women's issues is transphobic. So there you go. All language is now racist or sexist. Uh, and I'm going to play the clips in the next hour. Three top comics say that political correctness is killing comedy. This isn't the left. This is just pop left. The real left that cares about people uh, you know, is against GMO and against banks raping us, but so is the Tea Party. Notice how it was the Tea Party and a bunch of Democrats that were against TPP. In fact, if Nomi Prince can do five minutes the next hour, I want to ask her about TPP. Her new book, All the President's Bankers, The Hidden Alliances That Drive American Power, 
I haven't gotten the video of maniac cops straps handcuffed man to a chair and tortures him. We'll cover that coming up in the next hour. But first, I'm going to cover the disturbing new reports on the, de the degeneration of the Western brain. Physically, this isn't just culture. What's happening? Investigative report live. We're going to break it down coming up. Uh, Nomi, there's a quote on Infowars.com, and it's, uh, if you don't want a man unhappy politically, don't give him two sides to a question to worry him. Give him one, better yet, give him none. Ray Bradbury, famous author. Well, you know, that's true, but you want the illusion of choice, and that's what Carol Quigley wrote about at Georgetown in his secret CIA State Department published book that ended up going public, Tragedy and Hope where he admitted we already own both parties, we will more so in the future, there will be the illusion of choice, we'll have diversionary political battles, gay marriage, Confederate flags, while we take over and move us into a totalitarian system. I mean, these are admitted totalitarians. We've got three, four minutes to break, but uh, break down your excellent article that goes over this, Hillary Clinton, Jeb Bush, and the big banks. All right, so the whole idea of totalitarian, totalitarian power is about controlling money, policy power. I mean, it's, it's all part of the same equation. So if we look at Hillary and Jeb, they're just two examples of two dynasties that have gotten this right from their perspective, not necessarily from our perspective. And as you mentioned, this isn't a left-right thing. It, it doesn't actually matter because both of them are examples of decades-long relationships, associations, similar ideologies with the largest banks. You look at Hillary Clinton, you find you know, you, you find Citigroup because of the Robert Rubin uh, connection, which also gets you to Goldman Sachs because of the Robert Rubin connection, who was the Treasury Secretary Bill Clinton, who helped get Bill Clinton into office, who helped Wall Street galvanize between the initial Clinton bid for power and the White House and were very successful. They have all stayed friends. Hillary has spoken there. Bill Clinton, of course, as we know, through the Clinton Foundation, was getting lots of money for speeches elsewhere while she was both Secretary of State and later speaking at Goldman and other banking uh, conventions. So that connection, those relationships, they stay in place. That money, that power, that stays in place. The same token, you know, Jeb Bush, I mentioned before the Merrill Lynch connection, because back in the day it was Father Bush and the former CEO of Merrill Lynch, which is now part of Bank America, one of the big sixes who were part of the policy that deregulated the banking system, which when that happens, it allows the larger players in the banking system to have more money and power. So the governments in place that help to deregulate the banks both sure. uh, get collaborative power from that equation. No, I mean, we've yeah. got to go to break, and I'll give you the next five minutes if you can stay with us for a 70-second break. But I'm putting on screen for TV viewers uh, an article out of the Daily Mail, Piles of Diamonds and Porn. Concord and caviar, haunting images of crumbling palaces of Africa's dictators uh, where despots once lived like emperors. The only difference between these guys and North Korea and Kim Jong-un is they don't wear crowns. Same thing with the Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgans. They've stolen literally thousands of times what these African dictators did. They're just smart and don't really consume so conspicuously. But this is the opposite of free market. We'll be back in 70 seconds with our guests to talk about that and where this is all going in the predator economy. All right, now let's go now, to Nomi Prince. Austin, Here's Texas. my three questions in the five minutes we have left, and I really appreciate your time and energy and your struggle and giving up your career, very successful to expose the corruption and not going with the herd. We see Puerto Rico saying they're ready to go bankrupt like Greece. We see, we know that most counties and cities and states are worse off than Greece here in the U.S. We look at the numbers. We're signing on to the TPP, Obama's, been given Republican power to be a dictator. Got to give the Democrats credit for being against that. I, it's just, it's true. Uh, as bad as Obama is, the Republican leadership is just, just as bad or worse. We are in so much trouble. Where is this all going? Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to another another phase of the crisis that we're currently in. All, all of what you mentioned is 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 this is this movement of money and power away from well into the hands of those that already have it. It, it continues to be a consolidation. So if you look at Puerto Rico, you look at Greece, you look at states, you look at municipalities. These are all entities that never had or hadn't had the power to begin with going into this latest phase of the financial crisis, which gave the people at the top, the elite bankers and politicians and central bankers, the ability to take more in this period of time. Are away. they the new royalty? They, 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 they are the new royalty. I mean, I, I consider, you know, the Bushes and the Clintons uh, the same type of a monarchy as, I mean, actually more dangerous monarchy than, you know, anybody sort of, you know, than the Queen of England. Why? Because they control our capital. You know, all the old leaders and even what they were associated with over the centuries 
of monarchies did not control to the same extent the future capital because they didn't have the leverage. They didn't have the ability to fictitiously create money and then spread it into the most powerful financial private bodies in order for them to continue to amass control and concentrate their, their power over us. We had fewer banks now than we had then. We have more concentrated capital and power, therefore, than we had then. So, so yes, it, it's, it's a form of a monarchy. It's a form of a totalitarian government, but it's also something that's continuing. So, I mean, as I said a few years ago about Greece, as I said, you know, 12 years ago about what was going to happen in the financial sector, how that was going to implode and, and reconcentrate, because that is what happens every time something negative happens financially in the world. The people in power use it, sure. leverage it as a way to concentrate power. This is Will they get away this time with even a bigger power grab and bailout and grabbing our cash? How will the government spend that? I guess with some form of civil emergency or launch a war to get us to support the government? Well, honestly, it depends on how much we are willing to take it because, well, not necessarily, but what, what, it, what it looks like will happen to be by how much we take it. But our cash, our money, those, depo those trillions and trillions of dollars of deposits are the only thing on our side of the equation right now relative to the seven trillion from the two major central banks, to all the policies, to all the concentration power, all those meetings in Basel, to everything that happens. We are the only counteraction right now. Sure. And so, yes, that is why our money is at risk because there's nothing else to take. There's no other plan. So this is the plan. There, there's no, it's not a conspiracy. There's no other way That's right. to continue to make it work. We have a banking dictatorship, no better, in fact, worse, because it's more sophisticated than North Korea's dynasty, than African dictatorships. We now have absolute criminals in control, bipartisan, and it's time to wake up and realize they're illegitimate because they want to wreck us for full control. That's why Africa and Latin America are so poor. Their elites like to keep you poor. Ours are bigger. So, so, so you agree with that statement. In 60 seconds, know me, friends, know me, friends com. how do we stop them? What do we do? Well, again, we, we have the power of our own money. We have the power of our own vote. We have the power of our own voice. And that's really the only thing we can do. We have the power of the truth behind us. It's really hard. This, is, this gets to be a harder fight every single day because we are on the losing side of a capital and power grab that has policy behind it, that has, that has those, those institutions behind it that we are not. But we, are, we do have ourselves, and we do have our collective voices, our collective cash, our collective way of not keeping it in the biggest banks and putting it in smallest banks. Banks are our ability to take it out of the market rather than be the backside of what is going on in terms of this accumulation of capital and power. And so that is something that we have to be aware of. Uh, we have to understand it's a truth. It's not a, it's not a myth. It's actually happening. Um, and we have to take control of our own cash, our own voices, our own assets. That's and right. Our own truth. They want to take the cash because we can still vote for with our dollars, with our euros, and change things. It's the only power we have left that isn't a shooting war. We salute you, Naomi Prince. You're an amazing patriot for few humanity. Uh, thank you so much.